from the Environment Secretary, George Eustace, is with us. Hello. Good Tell us about this deal. Well, the challenge that we've had is as everybody comes out of the pandemic, the whole world, there's a lot of uh, disruption in supply chains. Uh, some issues with labour, issues with shipping, issues with logistics. Uh, and this latest uh, problem is that due to rising gas prices with a surge in demand for gas in parts of the world, this, uh, these two plants uh, have had to close because they've, uh, it's not been economic for them to sure. manufacture the fertiliser. That, uh, in turn, uh, means that there's this big uh, shortage of carbon dioxide, which is critical for use in uh, the, the poultry industry, the pig industry, other food sectors, beverage sectors as well. So we've uh, intervened to, to basically uh, support this company with some of their fixed costs uh, on a short-term basis, just for a few weeks, so that we can keep that carbon dioxide supply going and give the market time to adjust and for other supplies to come on stream. How much is it going to cost? Well, we're, I'm not going into the final uh, details of that because I know lawyers were still working uh, on those final Give me pieces a ballpark last figure. night. It's going to be in sort of you know many millions, possibly the tens of millions, but it's to underpin uh, some of those uh, fixed costs. So tens of millions, even just for three weeks. It's a big, uh, costly plant. These are two uh, big, expensive plants, and it's to, to help underpin some of those fixed costs. But it's going to be temporary. We, we do need, in the end of the day, we need the market to adjust. Uh, the food industry know that there's going to be a sharp rise in the cost of carbon dioxide, probably going from uh, something like £200 a tonne, uh, eventually up to closer to £1,000 a tonne. Wow. So a big, a big, sharp rise. It's a small uh, component, uh, but a critical component of their production. Um, and so the plant that's opening at the moment is the one on Teesside. But the one on Ch in Cheshire that we were just uh, reporting from outside of, that's going to open as well? Um, I understand that both of them uh, are going to, to reopen to bring those supplies back online. The, the challenge we've had is there is another factory in the UK, but that's currently closed for maintenance. There's also another factory that we often get supplies from in Norway. That's also closed for maintenance. So we have this perfect storm of um, two plants closing because they don't have a market for their fertiliser, um, because prices have risen, and uh, two other plants that are currently closed for maintenance. Once those plants reopen, then we'll be back into a properly functioning normal market. Could we not have seen this coming? Well, it's difficult to see this coming because um, we didn't foresee that these um, two plants would need to close. We've had a very sudden spike in gas prices. Um, there's a lot of, as I said, turbulence in global supply chains uh, at the moment as the world sort of comes out of the pandemic, comes out of lockdown, starts to get back to business as usual. We're seeing surges in demand for gas. That's having knock-on impacts that you can't always predict. And it is always the case, though, that carbon dioxide, there are a few uh, big players involved in it. It's a chemical process. These are big chemical plants. It's not where you've got hundreds of players and a, uh, an easily functioning market. You do rely uh, on big capital investment, um, typically run by a few big companies. And has it been a happy deal or have there been stern words? Um, no, look, it's, it's been, we've been pragmatic on this. Um, we know uh, that the, the truth is if we did not act, then uh, by this weekend, or certainly by the early part of next week, uh, some of the poultry processing plants would need to close. And then we would have animal welfare issues because you'd have lots of chickens on farms uh, that couldn't be slaughtered on time and would have to be probably euthanised on farms. We'd have a similar situation with pigs. So there would have been a, a real animal welfare challenge here uh, and, and a big disruption to the food supply chain. So we felt we needed to act. Yeah, it, it's almost as if you're knee-jerking to these problems, though, rather than actually getting ahead of them. You knew that two plants were going to be closed for maintenance. You knew how much we needed this CO2. And yet we found problems with the supply chain before you've acted, I suppose, is what some people would say. Well, we've acted before that problem presented itself. Had no, we it's not, not acted? Not really, have you? Because, well, I you know, think we are, have. Because... There are some empty shelves, and we've seen pig farmers and other people on the news saying these pigs should have been already at market and we can't move them because we can't have them euthanised. Well, look, we have a, a free market economy, and that's right. As a general rule, we believe that the market should adjust to these and that companies should come in. This, uh, in some ways, is an exceptional uh, set of events where we've got two plants that are closed for maintenance. That's coincided with uh, two other plants that have closed because they don't have a market for their goods. Uh, we couldn't foresee that. We do know that carbon dioxide uh, is a critical ingredient. We had previous issues, for instance, in 2018. Uh, but it is the reality that because it's um, a byproduct of a, a major chemical manufacturing process, there are a few big players 
uh, that control and dominate this market. Um, and that won't change when you have these sorts of processes that rely on heavy capital investment. OK, just final thought on that before we move on to other things. Um, you said that the, the deal's still being ironed out with the lawyers. Has um, production started again? It won't have started yet. Uh, it will take, uh, I understand, probably about 48 hours to get these plants uh, up and running properly. But obviously we'll be working very closely uh, with CF Fertilisers, the company involved, to ensure that happens as soon as possible. An American company, our uh, Prime Minister, of course, over in America at the moment. He's not coming back with uh, a trade deal, despite the fact that he was pretty confident uh, that he would be able to. It does really look as though we are at the back of the queue, doesn't it? Well, look, uh, President Biden's uh, always been clear that trade deals are not really uh, a priority for him at the moment. But look... Not with us, certainly. Well, we've done uh, 60 trade deals, including um, uh, an agreement in principle with Australia, an agreement with Japan, which is a very important trading partner. Uh, we still very much hope to be able to put together a, an agreement with the United States. Um, when? Well, look, we, we're not putting timescales on it. It's always better to get an agreement. We have Leave achieved... one before the next election, don't you? Um, we don't need one before the next election, but obviously we would like one. Uh, to, are you in, confident uh, of getting one before well, the next we, election? Well, we are confident that we will get one at some point, but it's just not a priority for the US administration. It's for us, though, it. isn't it? It is for us. And we, don't we have this special relationship still? Well, if you look at what we have achieved with the US, we have made breakthroughs on things like whiskey, where we've dealt with the tariff issues. We've got access now for British beef, which is uh, the first time uh, in decades. That's something we secured recently. We are in negotiation with them to get access for British lamb. So uh, alongside uh, you know, the bigger uh, comprehensive free trade agreement that we'd hope to do at some point, there are a lot of uh, individual agreements on individual products where we're making some good progress. You said we would have hoped to do that sort of... Uh... In the past, or are we still pretty confident that we will get that deal at some stage? The, the, the PM's been But we can't clear. say what no, sort no, of timeline. We, we want to do a, a trade deal with the United States. We've always been clear on that. We've never put a timescale on it. What um, are the sticking points? Um, I don't... It's just not been a, a priority for the US administration. I think President Biden's been clear. Um, it was clear during his election campaign that trade deals, you know, weren't going to be a priority for the early part of his administration. But he is doing a trade deal, of course, isn't he, with uh, Mexico and also um, Canada, and we're quite keen to uh, piggyback off the back of that. How would that work? Well, look, we don't rule anything out. Our, our preference is that we have a, a bilateral trade agreement with the United States, um, and obviously we're also joining the CPTPP partnership in Pacific. And uh, Oh, uh, we're getting into acronyms we... early in the morning. Yes, well, it's, the, it's a... They're essentially a trans-Pacific partnership. Uh, that's a, uh, an agreement with a, a group of like-minded countries. It's possible that the uh, United States will be uh, getting on board with that as well. So, look, um, we're, we're making progress on trade deals in many areas, 60 trade deals in place, including, as I said, with... with but particularly parts. this Canada-Mexico-America deal, do we want to get on the back of that one as well? well look, we don't rule anything out, but obviously, with any trade deal, uh, it's the detail that counts. Um, our preference uh, is to do a bilateral trade agreement with the United States. Uh, we still uh, hope that we can do that, uh, but there's not a particular rush to do it. With any trade agreement, it's better to get the details of the agreement right uh, rather than be in a rush. And President Biden's always been clear that a trade agreement isn't an early priority for him. He said that during his election campaign. Mm. Um, it would mean we'd have to have that pesky chlorinated chicken, though, wouldn't it, if we did a deal, if we jumped off the back of that deal? Um, and my director in my ear is going, ugh. Uh, you wouldn't have to because the... Um, uh, basically, the... the, the the import standards would be set by the UK. Uh, So-called SPS standards are set by us. There's a prohibition on sale of poultry treated with chlorine and uh, no, no plans to change that at all. Mm. What the President is quite uh, keen on is making sure that the Northern Ireland uh, trade agreement uh, continues as it is now. I mean, how important is it that a US President should be involving himself um, in internal trade issues in Northern Ireland? It's not got anything to do with him. Well, look, the United States obviously was involved in putting together the Belfast Agreement. So, to be fair uh, to him, he feels that the United States has... Northern a, Ireland Agreement, as we the, know. The Northern Ireland uh, Agreement. He feels he's got a role in that. Uh, but, you know, but what, um, what, what we, we, we want to help them understand is that what we are proposing in terms of our changes to the way the Northern Ireland Protocol works is all about upholding the principles of that Belfast Agreement, where it's about protecting uh, the place of uh, <coughs> Northern Ireland within the UK, <coughs> as well as making sure there's no border on the island of Ireland. So um, the, the provisions that we're putting forward, the proposals uh, we have, are actually all about safeguarding uh, peace, stability uh, in Northern Ireland and that Belfast Agreement. Mm. US President disagrees. Um, why is he wrong? Well, I think um, he's probably, uh, at the moment, just... Um, 
you know, reading the headlines, reading what the EU is saying, reading what you know Ireland might be saying, which is that they would like the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, to work in the way that the EU envisaged. Um, we think he's wrong because the truth is that unless we have a sustainable solution that enables trade to continue between GB uh, and Northern Ireland, then we are going to have uh, issues, and that itself would become a challenge to the Belfast Agreement. So those who believe, uh, as we do, in the, uh, the hard-won peace and stability in Northern Ireland have to make the Northern Ireland Protocol work on a sustainable basis, and that's why we have to revisit some of these provisions around the way it's interpreted. And could it be a bargaining chip for a trade deal with the US? Um, no. Uh, the reality is that it's for us to work out how we make the Northern Ireland Protocol work. So he should uh, butt out, really. <clears throat> it really has nothing to do with him. Well, it's not a bargaining chip in a trade agreement, but it's, um, it's legitimate for him to have a, a view on it, obviously, and express that view. Uh, and we'll obviously explain to the United States that, um, you know, effectively, what's, what, what it's tantamount to saying that potatoes grown in one part of the United States can't be sold in another part of the United States. I think when you explain some of those provisions in detail, uh, it is understood by the US government that that clearly doesn't make any sense and therefore should be, um, you know, should be revisited. I'm guessing he knows all of that. Um, well, look, um, it, it's a very complicated um, uh, piece uh, of agreement, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, I'm not sure he does uh, fully appreciate all of that. We're obviously doing uh, all we can to help the, the US um, government understand that. But principally, look, this is an agreement uh, between uh, the, uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol is an agreement between the European Union and the UK. The, the EU uh, said that they're open to engagement, discussion about how we can make it work. Um, what are we going to do about these pesky protesters on the M25? Well, you know, it is dangerous, the, the, the uh, protest activity they have and sometimes. And deeply frustrating for motorists very people frustrating. trying to get to work. Uh, of course, very frustrating when people are trying to get to work, go about their uh, business. Uh, there has been a, a robust police action so far to date. I know that early on some questions Wasn't were just, raised. Yeah. But to be... What did you think about them? Say, oh, is there anything that you need? Well, to are be fair, my understanding is that some of those protesters had glued themselves to the road. The police do have a, a duty of care uh, in that sort of situation. Uh, but there was some robust activity to, re to remove move uh, those protesters, but uh, the, the problems continued. We are seeking uh, to take legal action today. We're supporting Highways England uh, in that. What I will that look like? Well, I understand they're seeking uh, an injunction that would give um, uh, powers to the police to be able to act, uh, um, you know, preemptively should that be necessary. OK, and what about these people that we, and we're seeing being dragged off the road as we speak? Some of those people go back day after day after day. How are we going to stop them doing that? Well, <clears throat> that's why we're seeking from the court some, um, you know, strengthened powers to deal with this particular incident. We do have legal processes around this. Uh, the right to protest is very important. We protect that. But obviously, when that protest is uh, posing a threat to the safety of others, uh, we've also got a duty to act. Uh, and the police are acting and uh, acting robustly in this case. And they could find themselves uh, with the liberty being removed from them? I mean, some of these people are reverends, aren't they? They're people of the cloth. Yes. Well, look, it, it'll depend on the, um, the terms um, uh, of any injunction that a court's granted. And I but what would say, you like it to see? Well, I, um, we're taking legal action, I understand, to seek a, an injunction that would give the police um, stronger powers to be able to intervene, you know, preemptively to stop uh, these protests happening so that you're not getting a situation where you have to wait for them to sit on the road, cause chaos and then have to remove them after the event. OK, but what if they do and what if they continue... They ignore that, they continue to go and sit on the road and cause all sorts of problems for hours and hours and hours for people who are trying to go about their business. What should happen to them? Well, look, that, uh, it'll be at What's that your point. Well, uh, um, the, the truth is that if, uh, if people are acting... Uh, you know, against uh, a court order, then there's a there's a contempt of uh, court uh, element to that. But look, I'm not going to get into those hypotheticals. It would be for the not really law officers and, and legal advisers in government to advise what should happen at that point. But obviously, uh, people uh, have to abide, should abide by uh, court orders. Uh, if they fail to do so, then they're potentially acting in. How frustrated court. would you be if you were trying to get somewhere, like come and uh, chat to us on a? Wednesday morning at 7.05 and the motorway was closed and people were just sitting in front of your car. Yeah, deeply frustrated. So I can understand how frustrated people are. Uh, the government understands that. I know that my ministerial colleagues in both the Home Office uh, and in the Transport Department have been really on the case uh, with this, um, talking to the police, liaising with the police. And I think uh, what we've seen uh, in recent days is some quite robust police uh, action to deal with this protest. And you support that? Yes. Great to talk to you. Thanks Thank so much indeed for joining us this morning. Thank you.